over on this side. I'll pick somebody on Friday to make sure I press the record button on the other side. Because I do record my classes, and for, for you sports folks, that does help. Helps big time because I try to record them. I also, in Blackboard, will provide you all a link to my Physics 1 YouTube playlist. That's all of my past recordings that have sort of worked or sort of not worked for General Physics 1 and Engineering Physics. So if I don't explain it well the first time, or if I don't explain it well and you want to see it, and you want me to see me explain it a little differently, you guys have access to all my old videos on YouTube. The other thing about my videos on YouTube is I go ahead and let YouTube closed caption them. And YouTube doesn't do half bad closed captioning me. So I have not gone in and completely edited it, but for some of you that like to see the words and hear it at the same time, those are out there. I can't guarantee, just because of my schedule and you all schedule and everything else that I have to do, that I get the videos up right away. Um, I usually have them up within 24 hours, but Fridays are going to be interesting because I'm in transit quite a bit on Friday, so it may be closer to Wednesday of the next week before I get them uploaded. But I try to put upload them, to, and right now with the new technology, I haven't opened my files to see if it actually recorded right yet. So we've got some bugs to work out with the new technology. The really cool thing about the new technology is that it's called Zoom. It's very much like Skype or very much like FaceTime. Um, it has some other features. It's a software that I've used in business for a while. But that means that if, you, if I happen to be on the Enid campus and you guys need me on Tonkawa, or if I'm on the Tonkawa campus and you guys need me in Enid, and you're having a problem with a homework, you can email me and we can set up a time and I can do it with your laptop, through your laptop. So I, we can actually talk via over the computer and I actually have some more face-to-face -face time. I know it works and I know it works well because I ran a whole class over the summer, my, my engineering dynamics class, I had half of my students were coming in via Skype and we could get one-on-one -on -one with each other. They were all doing internships and so we were working on their lunch hours and internships and we were able to communicate and they were able to ask questions back and forth. So it really does work and I think that's going to help the ITV experience a lot. Because you guys can have access to me a little bit, a little bit differently. On the Tonkawa campus, there are two tutors that can actually tutor general physics, okay? We have one person is Corbin Crowder. He will be on campus and I don't have his tutoring hours yet. The other is a math tutor, but she has gone through both engineering physics one and has the background as well, and that's Kayla Hooper. And, she'll, and so hers are on the math tutoring hours. She's primarily for math, but I will tell you right now, from the math perspective, most of your problems or issues in physics that relates to the math, not relates to the concepts. So just, just be aware of that. So we do have two people that can actually help you if I'm not around that are in tutoring hours. So I'm gonna go ahead, well, before I switch over, um, my hours, so that you guys, for those of you who have been on campus around know that I'm usually on campus a lot I am on campus a lot. Um, my Monday classes start at 12.30. I'm here all Monday afternoons because I have a 5.30 evening class. On Tuesdays, so this is for you guys over in Enid, this is probably a good day to Zoom, to come to say, hey, I need some help and I want a, a Zoom time with you. Tuesdays, I have a 7.30 a.m. class and I have a 4 p.m. evening class, and I have a 7 p.m. evening class. So unless I have meetings on Tuesday afternoons, I'm generally in my office. So I'm very accessible on Tuesdays. Wednesdays, which is today, I have you guys, and don't try to find me after 2.30, because I won't be here. Thursdays, I've left them open. I have not posted office hours, and I will tell you tomorrow it's going to be a bad day. We're trying to get the rest of the hay in before the rest of the semester starts. With all this rain, we didn't get a chance to get all our hay in, and so we're trying to finish that up tomorrow. But I have a 4 o'clock and a 7 o'clock class on Thursday evenings. I'll probably be on campus around noonish. 
um, even though I only have a three o'clock posted hour. And for you guys over in Enid, starting at 8 a.m., I'm on the Enid campus from 8 a.m. until after my 1.30 class. It's probably be about 2.30 before I leave on Fridays on Enid. So if you need to come see me face to face, I'm on the Enid campus. And usually, unless the weather's bad, usually I'm on campus by about 7.30. Um, so that kind of gives you a heads up of when you guys can get a hold of me on Enid. But that means I'm nowhere to be found on this campus, on Tonkawa campus, on Fridays. Okay. Another important announcement. Today is Wednesday. We meet Wednesday. We meet Friday. You guys are in labs the rest of the time. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we do not meet. I will be in San Diego. I am at an American Chemical Society meeting, and at this time next Wednesday, I will be in one of the most boring meetings on the face of the planet. It's called ACS Council. All right. It's the governing body of the American Chemical Society. And at this point, we're getting the reports from the president, <coughs> reports from the board, reports from the boring part. So that's where I will be during class time on Wednesday. So you will not have, that doesn't mean you don't have plenty to do. You have plenty to do. You have plenty to do. So I am going to go ahead and switch to the computer. We're going to see how this goes. All right, you should see Blackboard. Oh, goody, I like the way that room's set up because I can actually see what you guys are seeing. Unfortunately, there we go. We got this side over here. Okay, so you guys, have, you can see Blackboard up there. Um, right now, it looks pretty boring and blank, right? It looks pretty boring and blank. I'm going to go up under syllabus so you can find the syllabus, but that's not the part you care about, right? You care about the grading scale. That's the part you care about. And you care about how to access your web assigned because that's the online homework. Okay, that's this part right here. So if you haven't already accessed web assigned, before you do, we're going to talk real quick um, about cheap options for books and things like that. But uh, that's the web assigned class key. The grading scale, I don't use a strict 100 or 90 to 100 as an A. I use 87 and a half to 100. And I do go to three significant figures. This is chemistry class, or physics class, not chemistry class. I am not as persnickety about significant figures in physics class as I am in chemistry class. So those of you who've had me for chemistry and know that I am very persnickety about significant figures, it's physics class, significant figures aren't as critical for what we're doing in general physics. But I do go to grades to three significant figures. There are plenty of places for points. My grading scale is 20% homework and assignments, 20% quizzes, 20% the lab, 20% exams, and 20% for the final. You have very good control over homework, quizzes, and labs. Homework, you have the opportunity for 10% extra credit by doing your homework early. It is built into WebAssign. Okay, it is built into WebAssign. If you get, and it's done by part. So if you only get half of the problem done 48 hours in advance, you still get the 10% on that half of the problem that you did 40 hours in advance. There's method to my madness. One is it helps get your homework done prior to, and it means that you started looking at your homework before we start lecturing on it, and so things are going to make a little bit more sense in the lecture. But there's 10% extra credit there, so you've got really good control on that. Quizzes are usually online through Blackboard or through WebAssign, so that means they're open book, open note, open everything. And yes, I know some of you are going to check it. I will also warn you that Chegg is not always right. And Chegg leaves out steps. 
Chegg is a good tool. It is not the end all be all. Okay. So you want to make sure that you, you've got it because when it comes test time, you're going to find out really quickly what you didn't learn just because you followed the exact steps in Chegg. So that's one of the things that are out there. So that's, that's my grading scale. Any questions about my grading scale? And I'm usually really good about getting the grades in. I do not let WebAssign actually dump the grades directly into WebAssign. I actually go in and type in the grades, which means you have to check my typing because occasionally I will do something or occasionally a, a key will stick and I will not get the points in there. So you want to be checking that ahead of time. And the reason I do that is because it helps me figure out where people are having issues. Okay? It, it really does. Do not use the ask your teacher function in WebAssign because I won't see it. I have too many other emails, too many other things to look at, and that's just one more place I have to go look. And I will not see it, and I'm not likely to see it. Email me directly if you are having a problem. You have a question? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to know what the story is on the, um, like, why A's are you know, 85, 87 to 100, uh, B's 75 to 80. You want to know the why? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll tell you the why. It's physics. <laughs> if you think about it, if you guys think about it, and I give you a test, and you have 20 We'll, we'll, we'll do 20 multiple choices, right? Do 20 multiple choices. And that means that if you miss two, you're already down to the 80, right? You're already down in your 80s. And it is very easy because we are working math problems to either have faulty logic that actually thinks about and makes sense, have faulty logic, and then when we have that faulty logic, we get the common, if I'm doing a multiple choice test, we get the common missed answer. So if I, and if I see my answer, then I think, okay, I'm doing pretty good because I see my answer, but it's the common missed answer due to faulty logic. And you miss two on a 20 question test, you're already down to the B. If I'm doing it via partial credit and I'm on a test and I've got that and I'm, and I have, if I'm doing very long problems, and say I only have five long problems, if I blow one, I'm already down to a C. Even if I give you partial credit, if I blow one problem, I'm down to a B. And it's really not a fair assessment of your knowledge. A fair assessment of your knowledge is if you can set up the problem correctly and you just ran out of time, well, that means you're on the right track. Doesn't necessarily mean you're on, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't get the material. And in physics, it's very easy to be sitting here on an hour time test or an hour and a half time test and have started down the wrong track and go, oh crap, I really know how to do that problem and I go and start to do that problem, but I've run out of time. And after having done this for many, many years, it works itself out. And, it prov and for most of you who have, oh my gosh, I'm panicking on a test, it relieves some of that pressure and you're not screwing up because you're panicking on a test. That answer your question? Yeah, and it works out really well. I can't, and what, what turns out actually with this grading scale, there's something called full range grading. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. Full range grading. I'm going to switch the document camera and we'll do it. See if it switches. Woohoo! It switched. Yay! I had trouble earlier with the new system switching to the document camera. Full range grading goes like this. We got a class, and, I'm, and we, let's say we got a class of about 20 people, and their actual end up percentage works out like this. We got somebody, because there always is somebody, right? That's got the 99, and then we got the people that got the 97s, and then we got the people that got the 94s, and then we get down here, we got the people with the 86s, 
and we got the people with the 85s, and we got the people with the 83s, and then all of a sudden there's a big gap, and we got the people with the 76s, and it never fails. The larger the group you have, the bigger the gaps there are. And one of my professors always used to say, he looked for the gaps and did full range grading because everybody was going to fall into a nice pattern. And it turns out that 87 and a half, nine times out of 10, falls into the full range grading pretty well. I don't usually have, over the course of the last couple of years, I might have one person that's in right at that little marker right at that right at that edge one person you usually end up so that's what full range grading is and that's why I do it and and there are other instructors that do it as well um, actually I got this one from this grading scale it works as the freshman chemistry um, person over at Oklahoma State and it works really really well and when I had 350 students in general chemistry Works great. Full range grading comes out and puts it nice and nice and out there. That being said, other things that I do to help. One is I will drop at least one quiz. I don't drop homework. Okay, I don't drop homework. And in the laboratory, it usually works out that I think he's dropping two. Is he dropping two labs over here? Yeah. Is he dropping one or two? Yeah, we want you there, but he, he does drop, I know he drops at least one lab. Um, partially because we know that there are things that happen and there's sometimes that are unavoidable to miss the lab due to sports and we don't do makeup labs. And that's one of, the, one of the reasons that are there. But I do drop a quiz. And you have a lot of opportunity for the extra homework. Other questions on the grading scale? No, I do not drop an exam. You drop the quiz, you drop any homework? I don't drop, I don't typically drop homework. So you drop just one quiz? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I have been known to drop homework. Usually it's more uh, weather related. When we've had issues where things have gotten there and we've had timing and the weather just makes it really sucky, I have dropped homework at the end, but... I don't typically plan on dropping any homework. Okay, all right, so let's do, let's talk web assign real quick. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, and this semester it's gotten really crazy. So um, typically, if you are in a math class and in physics class, since you guys are mostly sophomores and mostly pre-med students, you may already be done with your math. And so you may not necessarily be in a math class. But if you are, math class, your math class books are Cengage books. And your physics book is a Cengage book. <laughs> and this is definitely the cheapest way to go is Cengage Unlimited. There are other books on both campuses that are Cengage books. That includes, like, I think American History is one. Um, computer science is one. Uh, there are some other ones. You may want to look at the Cengage Unlimited based on which classes you're enrolled in. Used to, I made you direct bill to Cengage Unlimited, but I think we've made that switch. But I just wanted to show you that you guys have this option. And then I wanted to show you how you will get an email from the from the bookstore telling you which build, books are direct build. And so if you go under textbooks, um, that link will show you what books you currently have. So if we do this, I'm going to do Tonka Wall Stillwater. We're going to do good old physics here. PHYS. And we're going to do 1114 because that's what you guys are in. Oh, come on. I am the only section.
that's the loose leaf book but there's so i have you in cengage unlimited right now so you are already getting cengage unlimited i couldn't remember because i have different classes and different things so you're already being billed cengage unlimited you have the option of buying it through the bookstore or buying it through online it's a little higher price through the bookstore, but if you're on scholarship or through sports, you want to go through the bookstore. But your other classes, so let's say, for example, I'm going to go back and I'm going to reselect courses and I'm going to do my math. Let's do math. And I'm going to do, I think trig is 2103, I think. Nope, 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 that's not it. Let's do 1603 or 16. There we go. That's algebra for trig. You're being direct billed an extra 94 bucks. You want to opt out because your trig book is under Cengage Unlimited and you want to, don't want to be double billed. And you have until August the 30th to opt out. So now that you've been through all your classes the first time, hopefully you know which books are Cengage. And in my class, you're already being billed for the full term, the whole first term, Cengage Unlimited for four, for four months. So any other Cengage book you have access to already and you don't need to be double billed for them. So you want to go back and you have until August 30th to work through that. There was an email link that actually went through the books so that you can get there. And so that's going to be your cheaper option because if you don't want to pay 120 bucks for my book, plus another 94 for the other book when you've already got it covered under the 120 bucks for my book. And like I said, there are other books on campus that are Cengage books. I just don't know because I'm not as familiar with the ones that are in the, the, the liberal arts ones. If, you if it's a Connect book, it is not a Cengage book. So if it's Connect, um, a Macmillan learning book, it's not under Cengage. But there are several books that are there, and this is definitely the cheapest way to go is the Cengage Unlimited. And if you got questions, holler at me, and you can come by my office, and, and I'll help you out because I spent a great deal of time on the phone with the Cengage um, folks to figure it out. Okay, so there's my Cengage spiel. There's that, there's my syllabus. So to get to WebAssign, because that's the important part, you wanna know where your homework is, right? I know where your homework is. I have a link right here to WebAssign. Under course materials and assignments, right now it's blank, but typically what I will do is I will post stuff by week and that's where you're going to find your links to your videos. I will also post my YouTube playlist out there for videos. Um, the other thing about exams, I do allow a cheat sheet, a one page, eight and a half by 11, that you're allowed to write anything that you want to on it, provided it is your own handwriting and it's one-sided. So I don't make you memorize the formula. I don't make you memorize the formulas. There is no way possible in Physics 1 not to give you a comprehensive final exam. So the final exam will be comprehensive because we focus primarily on mechanics and we will use and we will build on stuff throughout the semester. There's no way possible. How many of you are planning on taking Physics 2 I got a good bunch of you. Physics 2 is a little different. Physics 2 is a little different, and we'll talk about that. But Physics 1, there's no way not to take um, or not to give a comprehensive exam. How many radiology people do I have? You got some radiology over there? All right, I'm going to be upfront with you guys right now. I do not understand why radiology does not require Physics 2. Radiology is based on x-rays. Radiology is based on x -ray, or, or waves, wave motion. Radiation is based on electromagnetic waves. All of that is in physics too. 
all of it's in physics two. Why they make you take physics one and not physics two, I haven't figured it out. I just don't get it. But so I'm just giving you a heads up that it would be a good option for you guys. Because all the stuff that you're gonna end up doing over your course career comes out of physics two. But that's where I will put it, and I'll put it by, by um, week. Okay, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing good. Okay, any other questions regarding schedules, the administrative mumbo jumbo that we gotta do? Okay, I will tell, I will warn you right now, I talk fast. That means you guys are going to have to say, yo, slow down or stop me. Okay, you're going to have to do that because otherwise I'll just keep trucking. And for you guys over in Enid, I try to watch my class monitors, but you guys may have to go, whoa, wave hands or do something or say, Robin, cut in because I got to. Okay, but please do. It doesn't bother me. There are two topics in Physics 1 when we get there that it will sound like I get snippy when you ask a question. There are two of them. I will tell you when we get there, and I will explain why right now. Most of the time, I can come up with an alternative explanation. I can give you an example that is going to make it make sense for you. Most of the time. There are two topics that I get snippy, and I'm not snippy at you. It will sound like I'm snippy at you, but it is, I am not. I am snippy at myself. Because I have never found another way to explain it. It is my problem, not yours. It is momentum is the big one. And the reason it is difficult for me to actually come up with an alternate explanation is because I don't understand why you don't understand it. It is like having somebody all their life know that the color of shirt that I am wearing is blue. We all know that that's blue. There isn't another name for that, that's blue. And, and it's that kind of a case where I have fingers on my hand. It's fingers. And I don't have a good way to explain it another way. And I know about this because my son was a pre-med type biology major and we had knockout drag out fights. And it was like, mom, you're not getting why I don't understand it. I go, no, I'm not getting why you don't understand it. And so it's, so it's one of those that it will, you know, I will explain it and I'll explain it again and I'll try and help you the best I can, but I will tell you right up front, it'll start, I'll start sounding snippy and it's because I'm frustrated with myself, not frustrated with you guys. So please, if it sounds like I'm getting frustrated with you and just say, you're sounding frustrated and then I'll take a deep breath and we'll try it again. And I, I just know that there are a couple on this one that, it's like, remember in college algebra, they did the square root of minus one and it's I. And you all go, why? I've been there. I've had that argument too. That's another one of those, it just is, get over it and move on. I got, I'm getting the last, because I had, I, my dad and I had a, when he took college algebra, I was his tutor. Oh God, why? Because it works. Why? Because it does. Right? It's one of those concepts. And what we finally tell you to do is accept it and move on and don't trouble your brain with it because it makes things work. All right? So, it's, you know, I, but, you, but we all know, we've all heard the teacher, and the teacher just goes, just move on, you know, just move on. So that's one of the subjects that, that we do have, have an issue so when you click over here on WebAssign, also do not get frustrated with WebAssign. Yes, I know, you've all, <laughs> I already heard the last, right? Because we've all been to math class, right? And we know that WebAssign is very, very persnickety, okay? 
If you feel like you've got the right answer and, and, and you think it's a formatting problem in WebAssign, like I didn't get the letter in there just right or I didn't get the, something in there just right, go ahead and take a picture of it and send it to me via email. Don't fight WebAssign and I will tell you whether it's a formatting problem or not. Okay, I will actually go in and tell you it's whether or not it's a formatting problem or there's another issue. So feel free to take a picture with your phone, take a screenshot, send it to me, ask me a question. Don't waste too many tries when you think it's a formatting problem. And in some cases, we can't figure it out either. And I'll give you credit for the, for the right answer because it looks like you have the right answer, but WebAssign's saying you're not. And if I took the two pictures together, we're, you're looking at it going, I don't see why it's counting it wrong. I'm gonna give you credit for it. That's another reason why I don't have WebAssign just drop in grades because it allows me to go and take care of things like that. So when you guys get in there for WebAssign, you guys are doing Physics 114, I'm going to go to Student View. All right. In there, you have the getting started. If you haven't been familiar with WebAssign, that one's in there just to get you back <coughs> into the swing of things. Things that are marked with PW, that means pre-work. It is intended to be done before we lecture over it. Part, most of those are the interactive tutorials that we have for this text. So it's gonna step you through stuff, get you familiar with different things. They are not worth a whole lot of points, but they, ought, but they do have point values associated with them. And then anything with the HW is the homework. Okay. And so that's the ones that are worth points and most of my homework assignments are worth 50 points. The pre-works are generally worth 5 to 10 points. I'm going to go ahead and open this up because I'm going to show you a trick. Okay, so here's the first problem All right, in the homework. And in chapter one, don't get bent out of shape about the formulas that they will show. What you're doing is doing unit analysis to show that one side equals the other, because invariably I will get somebody says, well, we haven't learned this yet, right? But you're trying to match units to one side or the other. That's the purpose of the problem. But up here, I wanna, I'm opening it up to show you this right here. That lovely little code. That lovely little code by each homework problem tells you some very valuable information. This happens, the SECP stands for the Searway College Physics. That's your textbook. So this question is coming out of your textbook. This number right here tells you the chapter that the question is coming from. All right? I'm not quite sure what the three is or whatever, but that's telling you the chapter. This right here, the P and the 004, tells you the actual number of the problem at the end of the chapter. So while WebAssign has put that in to the book or into the, the, the book, I'm going to switch over so we know that that happens to be problem four. I hope I have my, my entire chapter with me. We'll see. I do, I do, I do. That makes it much easier. Yeah, it's going to make it easier for you to get there. So I'm going to switch over to the document camera. So you have a chance to look at that problem. So here is the book chapter, when it gets there. You guys can see it over in Enid, there we go. So I'm gonna scroll in right here, I'm gonna get rid of that. There is the exact problem in the text. And then since we were ever so back in, in middle school, what do we know about our textbook? There. They have answers to the selected problems in the back of the textbook. Okay? 
and answers to the selected problems in the back of the textbook. Now, your numbers may be different, right? We all know that what's one of the things we like about WebAssign, because I can go over here and it'll tell me that I've got a rectangle with 2.0 and my rectangle has, um, it has a length of 2.0 and a width of 1.5. If I'm in WebAssign, it might be, instead of 2.0, it might be 2.1, or it might be 1.7. But if I can figure out this from the back of the textbook, I can certainly figure it out for WebAssign. And yes, I do use the textbook. Okay? I do use the textbook. So that gives you some ideas about how to use WebAssign and that gives you a little secret to WebAssign to help you out with the problems. I try to open up all the extra bells and whistles in WebAssign so that you guys can use them. That's up to you whether you use them or not. But that, but this, but that little understanding of the code should help you guys out. Couple other things about your textbook. Since I got this switched over. For those of you who are ultimately going to have to take the MCAT test, your book in the beginning has an MCAT preparation guide. So you know which sections that you're going to have to focus on. Okay, so that, that's one nice thing about the book that you've got. The, at the end of each chapter, if you don't read anything else in the chapter, the summary of the chapter is very, very valuable because that's going to have the information that's going to be your cheat sheet for working the homework problems because that's where your formulas are, that's where your major concepts are, that's going to give you a real handy, handy dandy way to do it. This book is very good about examples. The book gives you lots of examples, and the way they do it, you can actually cover the problem itself and then work through the steps without actually seeing it and then use it to check yourself. So the book gives you a lot of different, different aspects to it. So it gives you the problem, gives you a strategy, gives you a solution as to how to approach it. So the book actually gives you a variety of different, different pieces to it. Okay. I'm trying to keep myself organized so that I don't end up doing what I've always done and made myself totally a mess. All right, we ready? Ready to get started with all the mumbo jumbo. Um, I will also let you guys know I use something called Poll Everywhere to do my clicker type questions. I haven't set it up for today, but I, we use your cell phone, so I don't have to. I can set them up on the fly. Um, that also helps going back and forth between between ones. My cell phone policy, just so you guys know, because I actually use the cell phone for for as a tool. So I don't make you hide the cell phone or do anything. But if it becomes a distraction to your neighbors, you may be asked to leave and be counted absent. If it becomes a distraction too much, because towards the end of the semester, sometimes I've got people that are sitting there texting all the time back and forth on their phones. It becomes a distraction to everybody. You, you, you may be asked to leave the class entirely. I have a three strikes policy for cell phones. But I do use them for a variety of different things because they're good tools. There are some really cool apps on them, and they're good tools. So, um, so I can't totally outlaw them. But if they become a distraction, I will calmly send you out, and then you get a three strikes, you're out. If you're using the cell phone for cheating, you're definitely out. OK? So that's one of the things. All right. So let's start out with the fun stuff.
Why are you here? <clears throat> okay. So why do we start with physics? Anybody got any guesses? Scientific method, but I can learn a scientific method in biology and chemistry. Theories? When I say the word physics, what do you think of? Equations. Okay, somebody says equations. Okay, that's good. And I got a motion. Okay, guys, over in Enid, what do you think of? Actually, don't even have to stick to concept. If I say if I had said the word physicist, who do you think of? Einstein. We got Einstein. Come on, folks, over in Enid. This is a class participation. Richard Feynman. Oh, Feynman. Oh, I like that one. That's good. Feynman. See if I can spell it. There's a Y in there somewhere. I got a great story about Feynman. I actually got a couple good stories about Feynman. Oh, come on. Thank you. Oh, come on. There's somebody else. Who got kicked out of the church? Galileo. Galileo. A anybody else come to mind? Anybody see the lovely picture of a flea? See it in all the biology books. Who did the picture of the flea? Robert Hooke. Actually, Robert Hooke, back, even though he did the picture of the flea, he also did the frog twitching experiment. Everybody heard, remember that one? He put, you know, put electricity to the frog and made the frog's leg twitch. He actually was a physicist. Well, actually not, but... He did more physics than he did biology. <coughs> so now that you start thinking about what are these folks known for? That's one of them, the big thing. They're known for laws. And in our scientific method, we do an observation, we concoct, or we do a hypothesis, we do a hypothesis that's testable. That's the big key for a hypothesis. It has to be testable and falsifiable to have a good hypothesis. But we make an observation, we develop a hypothesis, and then we get something that's testable. So we conduct an experiment to get those experiments, and then we see how that compares with our hypothesis, and we develop a theory, and that theory allows us to continue to test. But eventually, it becomes accepted. And eventually, it becomes a law. And whether or not that law holds up, and as we'll see in a few other fun things, that the, something like Hooke's Law that we're going to use, <coughs> Hooke's Law only works under certain conditions. But under those conditions, it's, you can't violate it. Okay, a law is not violatable. Now let's talk about Newton's laws, because we know about Newton's laws, right? We got Newton's law of gravity, right? And we got Newton's law of motion, right? Got those two light part things there. And they and Newton's laws work really, really, really well. We can put a man on the moon based on Newton's laws. We can send out the Voyager spacecraft out of the galaxy or out of the solar system based on Newton's laws. But then Einstein comes along and says, 
Yeah, but it doesn't explain everything. Schrodinger and Feynman come along and it says, yeah, but I can't use Newton's laws to really explain what's going on inside the atom. So if I'm bigger than an atom and not traveling as fast as the speed of light, Newton's laws work really, 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 really well. Now if we take that to another approach, the fact that I can walk across the floor is based on Newton's laws. The fact that Galileo was able to make predictions based on some fundamental laws associated with observation. Now, when I get to chemistry, I can explain chemical reactions using those laws. Or I can explain things that are happening using those laws. Then once I get to biology, I get to a whole lot of variables, so things aren't quite as nice and predictable but it's still using Newton, you're still using the fundamental law. So physics really gives us the rules, the laws that we have. That's where we're looking at. Physics gives us the rules. And if I go back to look at Galileo and Newton and Aristotle and Archimedes, we didn't call them physicists. We called them what? We didn't even call them scientists. What do we call Aristotle? Where am I likely to learn about Aristotle? Philosophy. In my philosophy class. Actually, Newton was more of a theologian, to be perfectly honest. Newton was a theologian. Galileo had a real problem because he was doing all his stuff under the auspices of the Catholic Church. And everybody knows that the current pope is a chemist, right? Pope Francis actually was a chemistry teacher. So we talk about it, and up until about 1911, 1920, you couldn't find a physics book. It's not what we actually have. I have some in my office, some textbooks back from the 19, 1910s, 1920s. They're actually called natural philosophy or synthetic philosophy. Because we, we actually did this because we were trying to discover the rules of the universe. That's what we're doing, trying to find the rules of the universe. Which is one of the reasons that physics is elegant, because there's a lot of us that subscribe to the elegance theory. That if the solution is not elegant, we are not going to be, it's not right. So. Physics is going to deal with matter, and everybody knows what matter is. It's stuff, right? Because matter is different than weight. I can take a pin, and I can have the pin here on Earth. It has the same amount of matter on Earth. I can take it to the moon. It'll have the same amount of matter on the moon. I could put it on Jupiter, and it would have the same amount of matter on Jupiter, but the weight's all going to be different. Weight is a force. Matter is stuff. Right? It, and if we want to define it, it's something that occupies space and has mass. Mass is our fundamental, let's look at it. Mass is a fundamental unit. And in physics and in chemistry, we're going to use our unit as a kilogram. We're going to use that unit as a kilogram. That's weird. It's going in and out of focus all on its own. Let's see, we got that. Let's zoom out and see what happens. See if it's not quite so bad. Okay. Let's see if that's not quite so bad. The fundamental unit of mass is a kilogram. We'll use it. Anybody know what the fundamental unit of mass is in the English system? Now, I told you guys in my chemistry class. Gram? No. Think of a small, slimy creature. 
Huh? <laughs> moles aren't, they're nice and furry. A mole is a furry creature, unless it's a rat mole, right? Slimy, like a, like a slug. In the English system, it's a slug. In the English system, the fundamental unit of mass is a slug. It's always kind of fun. We also deal with energy. We deal with motion. And we deal with forces. And remember, weight is going to be a force. So we're going to look at, we're going to deal with matter, energy, motion, and forces. We're actually going to start with motion, because it's the easiest place to start. But one of the things that we want to do is we talk about fundamental units. And my fundamental units are going to be kilograms and slugs for mass. Then I have meters and feet for length. I have another one, seconds for time. We actually have a fourth one, but we won't get into it in physics one, but I like to do this for completeness. And that's a coulomb for charge. Physics two, we get into charge. But in physics one, we don't, we don't deal with it. But those are our fundamental units. All other units are going to be derived. And we start with our good derived units like area. And that's going to be meters squared because it's meters times meters. Volume will also be a derived unit because it's going to be meters cubed. That's meters times meters times meters. Velocity is going to be meters per second. Please speak it up. Thank you. Velocity will be meters per second. And so we're going to start mixing those units. Time's weird stuff, though, because time only goes forward. Right. Time's weird stuff, but we've got it. All right, now we can come forward. So we got our fundamental quantities. I'm going to write some things down. People think of days in a year. 60 minutes, 60 seconds. 60 minutes to an hour, 60 seconds to an hour. What's three? What? Uh, 3.14, somebody says pi. What's 27? <laughs> we'll get there. Well, first of all, I can tell you that that seven could be the number of people in the front two rows on this side. Could be the number of, oh, let's see, 
If I have a 14 pack of crayons, it could be the number of a crayons in the front row. You really don't know what any of those are. You assigned meaning to the first four of them because they were common. In physics, I am very persnickety. I may not be persnickety about significant figures, but in physics, I'm very persnickety that my numbers have to have units in order for me to know what that is. That could be seven meters. That could be seven centimeters. That could be 365 widgets. It could be 365 kilograms. It could be 365 grams. Without, num without units, those numbers don't mean anything. And actually, of those five that I put out there, up there, that 3.14, that one can be listed by itself because that's a ratio. That's pi. And pi doesn't have units. So that 3.14 can go either way. But when I'm dealing with my numbers, I actually need to know what those units are. Now I put 27 up there because we all have common conversion factors in our head and that's why I do the seven, that's why I do the 365, that's why I do the 60 because if I give you 60, many of you put minutes to an hour, many of you put second, you already have a whole bunch of conversion factors in your head. All right, everybody's got a piece of paper out in front of them. I want you to draw on your piece of paper a line that is approximately one inch in length. And I can't see you guys over in Enid, but I want you to do it too. Everybody got their line. Now, right below that line, I want you to draw a line that's approximately 10 centimeters in length. And I'm going to walk around over here because I got a sampling over here. Does everybody remember what is it? Wait, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, what's the answer to the universe? 42? Okay, come on, I want to go back here. I have to hit two buttons. Okay, got it. All right, most of you, this is where the biology part comes in. How many people have horses? I got a couple over here. How many over here need to get some people with horses? When I have a foal, I can approximately tell how tall the horse is going to be. Why? When, right, right as soon as the foal hits the ground. Because it's standing up? Well, one of the bones in the horse's leg is like two-thirds the size it will be when it's an adult. Okay, when it, the, the instant it's born, it's pretty darn close. You can take it and you can actually project the size of the horse based on that particular bone. Turns out that almost every one of us has a MacGyver type scale for one inch. The distance between this knuckle and this knuckle on your index finger. Now there are some of you that will, you know, if you start looking at Shaq, 
Shaq's not necessarily going to be one inch, but most human beings, that bone is approximately one inch, which is why we could come up with the original standards that we use the king's um, knuckle face, or we use the length of his arm from his nose to the tips of our finger for a yard. All right? And I can't remember who's the guy right now that's got the wingspan of some horrible the basketball player that his the tips of his fingers are taller than I am. It's greater than six feet. I mean, it's ridiculous. There are some differences out there, but most of us have an inch. And walking around the room over here, most of you got pretty close to an inch. Some of you are a little long, some of you are a little short, but most of you got pretty decent one inch. A conversion factor that you should ingrain in your head, absolutely totally ingrain in your head, is that one inch is 2.54 centimeters. And it's an exact number, has infinite number of significant figure zeros after it. But one inch is 2.54 centimeters. So your 10 centimeter line should be approximately four times your one inch line. And I knew it was longer. <laughs> Walking around the room, I think I only saw about three, maybe four in this room on this side that had something reasonably close to four times the length of their one inch line. That gets me back to the number 27. In physics class, because we're going to do it that way, we're going to work in the metric system. We all have a built-in system of estimation. And that's what we're going to work on on Friday. We're going to do estimates, a variety of estimations <coughs> and things. We all have a built-in system. So we know, most of you know, if I ask you to run 100 yards, you've got a pretty good picture in your head because we all watch football. We have a pretty good idea of how long 100 yards is. We have a pretty, you know, we have a good mental image of that. We have a good mental image of what something is one inch. We have a really good mental image of that. Now, one of the things that we get to do when we're in physics class is that we want to make sure our answers sound reasonable. And if we work in meters per second, we have no frame of reference to tell me whether or not that number sounds reasonable. So what's going to happen is you're going to do a calculation and you're going to say that the horse ran 460 meters per second. And you have no way to know if that number makes any sense, makes any physical sense or not. You don't. Now if I tell you that that number 27 was in meters per second, and you just told me that the horse ran 450 meters per second, you still again don't have a good sense of, of whether or not those numbers make any sense. I would even tell you that a horse running 27 meters per second is probably not right. It's probably too fast. Because if I'm in a car and I'm traveling 60 miles per hour, I am traveling approximately 27 meters per second. So that 27 is a good frame of reference to compare it to something that we're very, very familiar with, which is 60 miles per hour. So when, I, you know, so when we're starting to think about whether or not my answers are reasonable, we got to kind of put it in units that make sense to us. And that's one of the things that we want to look at is making those units make sense to us. Now, I'm going to ask the question, how many of y'all have, everybody in here has had Kim 1, right? Y'all have had Kim 1 over there in, uh, in, in Enid, right? Most of you have had chemistry. Gen Kim 1 for the first half is all about conversions. We convert grams to moles, moles to grams. So many times we're blue in the face. We convert things from molarity to milliliters to liters. We do conversions. You get to do conversions in physics too, as well. We do those conversions. So unit analysis is going to help us with our conversions. 
Unit analysis, not only does it help us with our conversions, unit analysis tells me whether or not I've set up my problem correctly. If I'm setting up my problem correctly and I want to get a velocity, which is in meters per second, and I actually am tracking my units as I go through and I get meters per second squared, I've obviously done something wrong. Or you get meters per second times seconds and then I'm only in meters, I've obviously done something wrong. Or I've set up my equation incorrectly. So those unit analysis things really, really come into play. And that's where I'm going to stop today because I know brains are full. I'll see you guys in person on Friday. I'll see you guys virtually on Friday.